Well, hi again, and greetings from northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy with another episode of Flat Earth Can't Science. Before we get on with this week's episode, I'd like to remind everybody to please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Well, we've been up about three weeks now, and we've gone from 15 subscribers up to 900. I don't do this for any monetary gain, but it warms my heart to see the people who are watching the videos. I also like seeing your comments and hearing how these videos are helping you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I was kind of busy dealing with my hormones when I was in high school and didn't give this as much attention as I wanted to. After watching a lot of these Flat Earth videos, I think a lot of people had the same problem, so I thought I'd go over gravity and buoyancy again. Well, first let's go over a few effects of gravity. Gravity is what tells us what is up and what is down. Gravity directly causes buoyancy, and all things tend to move towards the center of gravity. Gravity is what holds water, us, and everything else on the surface of the Earth. And finally, because gravity causes all mass to try and migrate towards the center of mass, all large objects will collapse into a sphere. We'll talk about gravity a little bit more, but first, let's go for an effect of gravity, specifically buoyancy. Did you ever wonder how much helium we have to put into a blimp to make it fly? While the blimp itself may weigh many thousands of pounds, we can actually calculate how much helium is required to make it fly. But first, we have to clear up some misconceptions about buoyancy. Light objects do not float. Heavy objects sink below the lighter objects and force them upward. In the case of a helium-filled balloon, the denser air is pulled down more strongly by gravity and displaces the lighter helium upward. In the absence of gravity, not only do we not know which way is up and down, we no longer see the effects of buoyancy. We know that when we drop an object and it is in free fall, it's in a zero gravity condition. Let's do a short experiment where we drop a bottle after blowing some bubbles in it and see what happens to the bubbles. Box drop. Okay, water bottle in a box. Three, two, one, drop. So you can see as soon as I release the box, the bubbles just stop where they were. And actually they don't stop completely. If it were at completely zero G, the bubbles would stop completely. But you notice that they continue to go upwards just a little bit. And the reason that happens is because it's not really at zero G because the box is actually falling and it has some air resistance pushing against it and that creates a tiny little bit of G-force. So the only true way to simulate zero G is by dropping something in a vacuum. And NASA actually has a big drop chamber like that. It's a huge vacuum chamber and they drop stuff in it to simulate zero G. So to get rid of that, I'll remove the box altogether and just attach the GoPro to the water bottle. You won't be able to see the bubbles quite as well, but you can still see what's going on. And there'll be a lot less wind resistance, so a lot closer to zero G. Let's see what happens. Okay, water bottle drop without a box. Three, two, one, drop. So you can see at the bottom of the bottle, the air bubbles in the water just completely stop and just stand still. And another thing to notice is notice that before I drop it, the bubbles are all squished because the pressure on the bottom is greater than the pressure on top, so it squishes the bubbles. But when I drop it, since there's about equal pressure on all sides of the bubble, it's almost round. So this test is really cool because it shows that gravity causes buoyancy. Okay, so let's go back and look at some basic physics. The first equation that we should look at is force equals mass times acceleration. The measurement of force is the Newton, which is one kilogram accelerated to one meter per second squared. Now on the surface of the Earth, our force due to gravity is our weight in kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is the acceleration of gravity. Now my mass is about 90 kilograms and at 9.8 meters per second squared that means that my weight is 882 newtons. Since we weigh ourselves on earth our bathroom scales are already calibrated to one gravity 9.8 meters per second square and read off our weight in kilograms. Now on the right side of the page we're going to see two sets of equations that describe gravity. The top is newtons. 
Newton was primarily concerned with the magnitude of the force of gravity. Einstein's equation, which is on the bottom, relates mass to space-time and is more directed towards the cause of gravity. To visualize this a little better, Newton's universe was a clockwork universe. He viewed gravity as an intrinsic property of mass, and it instantly affected all mass around it. As in most of our day-to-day -day lives, we're concerned with the effect of gravity. This is a very simple and elegant way to describe the universe. There are some minor problems with this, and as a result, Einstein took a closer look at it at the beginning of the 20th century and developed the concept of relating mass to space-time and creating distortions in space-time that affected other objects. Both of them essentially say the same thing. Both relate mass to the distance between the masses to determine gravity. While Newton basically said gravity existed, Einstein demonstrated how it worked. To figure out the effects of gravity, we need to know two things, the distance between two objects and their masses. Let's start off looking at the Earth. The most important distance that we have to look at on the Earth is the radius of the Earth, and let's see how that's determined. More than 2,000 years ago, Eratosthenes measured shadow differences between two locations of a known distance on the Earth. And from that, he was able to calculate the circumference of the Earth to rather good accuracy. There's a link to a video I did in the description to this video that shows exactly how he did that. And it's a very elegant mathematical problem. And he actually came up with a pretty good approximation of the actual circumference of the Earth. Once we know the circumference of a sphere, it's a simple matter to calculate the radius. Since we don't want to rely on a single method to calculate the radius, here's a second way that we can confirm the radius of the Earth. We know that on a sphere we're going to have a drop over the horizon with distance. We can clearly and easily measure that on the surface of the Earth. Knowing the distance between the two points and knowing the drop, we can actually calculate the radius of the Earth from that. A third method is to calculate the latitude of two locations of known distance apart on the Earth. We know that each degree of longitude is approximately 69 miles. Multiplying that out by 360 degrees to complete the circle, we again have the circumference and hence the radius of the Earth. Well, back to the physics slide again. As you see from that top equation, the force of gravity, according to Newton, is the gravitational constant times mass 1 times mass 2 divided by the radius between them squared. Now, the other interesting thing is that the force is also the mass times the acceleration of gravity. By setting these two equations equal to each other, if we can find g, the gravitational constant, we can do some interesting things. At the end of the 18th century, Cavendish actually created an experiment which has been reproduced tens of thousands of times since that allows us to calculate g, the gravitational constant. And here is that experiment. Basically, you have two large masses that are fixed, and then you have two smaller masses on a swinging bar and a torsion scale as the smaller masses are attracted to the larger ones, they twist the wire, and that twist, combined with the oscillation time, allow us to calculate g, the gravitational constant. Once we have g, the gravitational constant, the magic begins. Newton gave us the formula, f is g m1 m2 over d squared. But he didn't have instruments sensitive enough to measure the constant g. He didn't know what it was. It took many years later and a man named Cavendish to use a torsion balance to measure this very tiny constant. And he found that the value of this constant was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared over kilograms squared. The day they found that constant, they also were able to find the mass of the Earth. Here's what they did. 
Imagine a little mass m sitting on the surface of the Earth. It's a distance d from the center. We have a formula that tells us how much the Earth pulls it down. w equals mg. We can find some little mass m and we know g. Well, Newton had another formula that also told us the force pulling that mass down. g m m e over d squared. Now both have to tell us the same answer. Both will tell us the force in Newton's pulling that mass m to the center of the Earth. Therefore, we can equate these two equations. mg is equal to g m m e over d squared. They both have to give us the same answer. We can cancel out the m's, and we are left with a very simple equation. g is big G times m e over d squared. All of these are constants. We can solve for the mass of the Earth. And that is how we found the mass of the Earth. But as I said at the beginning of the program, Newton's gravity mostly was one of magnitude. To find the actual cause of gravity, Einstein had to step in. The cause of gravity, according to Einstein, was the effect of mass on space-time. Many of Einstein's breakthroughs came from what are called thought exercises. He used the example of riding in a train car at 60 or 80 miles an hour and how he could get up and freely move about the train car. Despite the outside speed, he was basically standing still inside the train car. Once he worked that out, he began to imagine himself riding on a beam of light, and the result was the theory of relativity. When it came to gravity, he imagined what would happen to the planets if the sun were to suddenly disappear. The following clip takes us through that thought exercise. Now, let's replay that catastrophe and see what effect it would have on the planets according to Newton. Newton's theory predicts that with the destruction of the sun, the planets would immediately fly out of their orbits careening off into space. In other words, Newton thought that gravity was a force that acts instantaneously across any distance. And so we would immediately feel the effect of the sun's destruction. But Einstein saw a big problem with Newton's theory. A problem that arose from his work with light. Einstein knew light doesn't travel instantaneously. In fact, it takes eight minutes for the sun's rays to travel the 93 million miles to the Earth. And since he had shown that nothing, not even gravity, can travel faster than light, how could the Earth be released from orbit before the darkness resulting from the sun's disappearance reached our eyes. A planet like the Earth is kept in orbit not because the sun reaches out and instantaneously grabs hold of it, as in Newton's theory, but simply because it follows curves in the spatial fabric caused by the sun's presence. So with this new understanding of gravity, let's rerun the cosmic catastrophe. Let's see what happens now if the sun disappears. 
The gravitational disturbance that results will form a wave that travels across the spatial fabric in much the same way that a pebble dropped into a pond makes ripples that travel across the surface of the water. So we wouldn't feel a change in our orbit around the sun until this wave reached the Earth. What's more, Einstein calculated that these ripples of gravity travel at exactly the speed of light. As part of this concept of space-time, Einstein also postulated that light could be bent by heavy gravitational fields. To confirm this, Sir Arthur Eddington used the solar eclipse of May 29, 1919 to test for the bending of light. After carefully mapping the relationship of several groups of stars that would pass behind the eclipse, Eddington sent out teams to photograph the eclipse and try to identify those stars. During the eclipse, these same stars were photographed as their light passed by the sun, and it was found that the light was deflected by the exact amount Einstein had predicted, thus confirming his theory. The final piece of evidence to confirm Einstein's theory was obtained in 2016, when gravitational waves were finally detected and confirmed. So to summarize this clip, we discussed gravity. We discussed how the radius of the Earth was calculated and showed a number of ways of doing it. We discussed buoyancy and how it was dependent on the presence of gravity. We demonstrated how the gravitational constant was obtained and how we weighed the Earth. We discussed Newton's mechanical approach to gravity and how it is used to develop the magnitude of gravitational force. And then we finally ended up with Einstein and the cause of gravity and the confirmation of Einstein's theories. I want to thank everybody for holding out through the end. Make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel. And I want to thank all of the people that contributed video clips to this presentation. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Happy holidays, everybody.